All right, welcome back uh, to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited. It is uh, 10 December. This is video number 99. And so, like I was saying, I go through hundreds of, well, not hundreds, but uh, yeah, I'd say hundreds of these videos a week, um, either through the UGA archives or the um, YouTube um mainly uh, Foggy Melson's uh, archives there of news and then I've been going through a lot of UPI and uh, AP uh, news articles and finding a lot of good stuff really 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 good stuff now again I'm focusing on this Michael Thevis because I, it's just so many connections here between Michael Thevis and his rump organization that's left over after he goes to jail and intersecting with Wayne Williams all along the way in what happens in the Atlanta child murders and so I found this one's really interesting it talks about uh, Hannah who I believe was an employee or someone that was Thevis was involved with their murder somehow I don't know exactly how. Um, I do know after this time that there was another person that Thevis was accused of killing, that he had his uh, co-worker Underhill set a bomb, but I'm not sure if it's this guy or what. They found this guy in the trunk. So I'm not exactly sure who this Hannah is, but hopefully we'll be able to find out. And again, I'm going to do a whole new series of videos on uh, Michael Thevis. I'm just going over this because it has something to do with Jimmy Jen. And then Jimmy Jen, of course, has a lot to do with um, Wayne Williams. But anyway. Oh, hold on one second. The 59-year-old gambler was last seen at a Marietta Street bookstore. Its owner, Mike Thevis, told Hannah's wife that her husband left the store shortly before 8 o'clock last Friday morning. When police found Hannah's body, they also found a parking ticket stamped 10.03 a.m. Friday. Police believe Hannah's body was in the trunk of the car at the time it was parked. This would mean Hannah was killed during daylight and within two hours from the time he left the bookstore. Another mystery is the disappearance of bookstore owner Mike Thivis, who reportedly flew to New York over the weekend. And police are still wondering what the ramifications will be among Atlanta's racketeer community. There is a theory that Hannah's death was brought on by an internal struggle among some of Atlanta's growing pornographic operators. Meanwhile, the deceased gambler's body has been flown to Fort Pierce, Florida for burial. His wife has been instructed by police not to talk, and the case remains a mystery. From Atlanta Police Headquarters, Charles Harmon, WSB News. Wow. So, there's a lot to unpack there. They just threw out a bunch of stuff. It's very interesting. So, he left Michael Thevis' pornographic bookstore, Marietta, at 8 o'clock. And then he's found in the trunk of the car, dead. And the parking ticket... So he was found in the back of the car... Um, and then s parked, I guess, in Marietta in the square there. And someone came along, a parking attendant came along, and gave him a ticket at 10 o'clock. So that means, of course, he had to have been killed before 10. So between 8 and 10, he was killed. And then Michael Thevis um, leaves town and heads to New York. So that's very interesting. All right, let's see what else we got here. Hold on one second. All right, so the very next day on the 19th of November, you got Michael Thevis in New York speaking through his attorney. So let's see what he has to say. Today, police pursue the angle that Hannah's dealings in Atlanta's pornography business led to his death. This morning, Lieutenant C.J. Strickland questioned Mike Thevis a man who's been called the kingpin of Atlanta's smut industry. Thevis is believed to be the last person to have seen Hannah before his death. Thevis and his Maryland attorney, Bob Smith, faced reporters after this morning's 90-minute session. 
so far as I know, they've given no indication they have any further desire to talk with him. Did you answer most of the questions or did your client? Invariably. Mr. Mr. Thebus answered the questions fairly and candidly. When did you go to New York, Mr. Thebus? Mr. Thebus did not go to New York. That was erroneous. That was erroneous. Yes, he was not in New York. So he was in town all, all the way. He was available at all times. Well, why was it so difficult for the police to uh, locate him if, in fact, they were trying to? If, in fact, they were trying to, they tell us they weren't. And that's just what was told me by Lieutenant Strickland. No, sir. Please. Nothing at all. I think the whole thing is pretty ludicrous. Uh, I don't have any knowledge as to what happened to uh, Mr. Hanna. He was a personal friend of mine, and I just think it's a terrible tragedy. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Let's take a look at this. That must be the car they found Hannah in. So Hannah must have been from Florida. All right, so basically, You've got Thevis wiping out his competition there. All right, so let's see. It says, May's peep show owner murdered by dynamite blast when he turned on his van to go home. Yeah, so that's the one that Underhill, another employee or whatever I believe of Thevis is, and th three years later, boom, he has him killed. I forgot exactly what it was, but I think he either threatened Thevis or threatened to expose Thevis to the police. And so he had Underhill kill him, and then he kills Underhill like five years later when he's under arrest and turns state witness for the police. He guns him down. It's a very, very violent guy. So let's see what he has to say here. This is... September 13th, 1973. The explosion had ripped the top of the van truck loose and broken out windows and spread debris uh, on top of a building located at 119 11th Street. And blown out some windows in a vehicle that was parked across the street that was headed west on uh, 11th Street. At this time, we don't have any motive as, as far as the killing goes or no any reason why that he should have gotten killed. All right, we're going to do the next video in a second, but I want to take a look at that address. So remember, uh, Thevis had that studio at 125 Simpson, but... Right up near Techwood is where his um, headquarters was for his general recording corporation. So he's trying to basically launder his money and hide his uh, ill-gotten wealth by getting into the recording industry, the music industry, and... Uh, other types of movies. So I think that's right off of like Ponce and Piedmont. Yeah, right there. All right, let's take a look here. Yeah, see? Hold on one second. See, because this is, um, yeah, there's Ponce de Leon right here. There's the Fox Theater. Now, the Suchi Lounge was, like, right here. So it's right down the street where this guy got blown up. This is actually... This is Juniper. Yeah, oh, wow. <laughs> this is right near a Colony Square. Where my mom was working there before she went to work at the Omni <coughs> in the early 70s. 
she worked at Colony Square. And again, I would go, we were living with my dad in Monroe, and so when she got us for the weekend, um, she had to work, she's working like two jobs. She would come get us, and then we would go hang out with her at Colony Square, and we'd go in these big executive offices at the top. That was a lot of fun. Got to look out the windows and stuff like that. And I remember the first video game I ever saw was Asteroid. And this is like the early 70s. I don't know exactly, maybe like 71, 72, 73 maybe even. But it was Asteroid. And it was in the lobby downstairs from um, in the Colony Square there. And that was one of the first games I got, games I got to play. You know, parents, when they're working, they give kids money so they can play video games and stay out of their hair. But yeah, so he got blown up there. Now, Thevis is, it's really interesting because uh, Ted Turner's business was right here, I believe. WTBS was like right there. I think we, we went over there once. And... Um, Let's see, his studio was right right here, off Simpson, I believe. Or maybe this is Simpson. Yeah, it was right in here. And then Thevis' office was like right over here. I believe it was, it was a, yeah, it was like right in here, and of course this is Techwood. He was right by Techwood. All right, so let's take a look at the other video there. Well, we have no speculations at this time as to whether it was a, a gang war or any time. We don't really have any motive whatsoever at this time. He was running a peep show there at... Uh, 1029 Peachtree Street. Now, as far as organized crime or anything of this nature, we have nothing that says that he was involved in anything of this nature. We can find no record of him being arrested for anything. All right. So, you see? There's like this war going on with Thevis against all these other um, pornographers in Atlanta and in the south and actually across the country but especially near uh, near him so he's trying to wipe out the competition and let's go to that address there 1029 Peach Street yeah While it's near the Federal Reserve Bank. There, I believe that's a big AT&T building there, but that wasn't there back then. Yeah, wow. Just down from Colony Square. Anyway, uh, let's take a look. I don't, I'm pretty sure that that's not there anymore. But what is there? Oh, is it a park? Let's see, 1029 would be right there, I think. Yeah, 1029. Does that say Pop? Is that a restaurant? Yeah. Prime Cigar, Prime on Peach, pa Prime on Peach Street. So that's a restaurant, that's a cigar place. Cigar Place Restaurant. See, so this whole area... You know, back in the 70s, if you went down Peachtree here, as you go down Peachtree, there would be just, you know, it wasn't all these big condos and office buildings. There were some, but not a lot. But there were a lot of uh, movie theaters, a lot of them pornography theaters, 
a lot of clubs, dance clubs, you know, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of strip clubs. And Thevis was involved in all of that. The mafia, this Gambino family he was working with, they were bankrolling him. And he was basically, you know, it's like, um, okay, like we'll say McDonald's Corporation. You may have McDonald's Corporation head headquarters, wherever that is, you know, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. But each city has a franchise, okay? And it, it may say McDonald's on the arches there, but that, fran that McDonald's and a couple other McDonald's may be owned by a franchise owner who may own a certain territory that he's bought from McDonald's, okay? And he bought the franchise rights for that territory. And then with those rights, he gets a certain, you know, a lot, most of the money, but he has to send some of it back to McDonald's Corporation, just like in any kind of franchise. And so this is exactly what you have going on with Michael Thevis. You got this mafia Gambino family, they're bankrolling him. You know, whenever he goes and buys a restaurant, it's not Michael Thevis' money. He may say it's his, but it's some offshore corporation, some New Jersey LLC that's set up as a front and that's handling the Gambino's money that they got from Las Vegas or other ventures. And they're they're trying to launder it, okay? So they're using Michael Thevis's restaurants and pornography and strip clubs to launder that money. Okay, they're silent investors. They're giving him the money. He's going in and, uh, you know, buying up these restaurants. And basically, it's sort of like this. If he comes to you and says, hey, I want a percentage of the business and I'm going to be a partner of yours. If you say yes, he's going to be a partner of yours. You're going to get money, da 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 and he's basically going to run it. If you say no, he's going to try to bribe you. If you continue to say no, he's going to try to threaten you. If you continue to say no, he's going to blow you up or kill you. So it's sort of that kind of, you know, mafia. They do this all the time in the Russian mafia over there, which is exactly what Putin's doing over there. All right, so that's what Michael Davis is doing. And I remember, you know, my mom would take us to uh, the Fox Theater because at one end you had Colony Square and on the other end you had the Fox Theater and somewhere around Piedmont Park I believe she was living she had an apartment or something like that I seem to remember you know but I'm like five six years old you know so I'm not really paying much attention all I remember is as we went from the Fox Theater which is what down here driving up Peachtree there'd be all these glowing lights from all these um, you see they got all these parks now but this was it it wasn't like this back when I was here you know all these had clubs in them oh there's this there's that club again yeah they had clubs they had strip clubs they had porn theaters all this stuff you know stuff was going on and they you know they rule the night that's how the mafia makes their money they they are either selling things that are illegal or they're doing legal business but also fronting illegal things through that legal business so they may have a strip club but involved in that strip club they may be running you know prostitution out of there they may have a dance club, but out of that dance club, they may be fronting um, drugs. You know, someone in there selling drugs. This is exactly what Nathaniel Cater was doing. He'd go over to the Cameo Lounge um, or the Suchi Lounge, and he'd look for clientele. You know, that's how he made his money. He was a prostitute. All right. Okay, let's go back. So I think we ended that one. Yeah, hold on.
All right, so it says, analyst says dynamite used in bomb uh, murder of maize. Peep show. All right, so let's take a look at that one. So basically, he tried to bribe him. He tried to muscle his way into the guy's business. The guy said, no, go fuck yourself. Michael Thevis, and Michael Thevis had him blown up. Pretty simple. Yeah, there you go. And this is from uh, 20 September So did he say toilet? Hold on a second. I think he blew him up in the toilet. So he put a bomb in a toilet or a bathroom where he knew it would go, and then he blew him up. Wow. Wow. Yep. All right. So this is really interesting because after this, I've read about some other stuff about Michael Thevis. After this guy gets blown up, that's when the police and the FBI start really focusing in on Michael Thevis and his businesses. The IRS comes after him. And there's this series of, I think it had already started, but especially after this, they really clamp down on him. He ends up going to jail uh, because he's not paying taxes on a lot of these uh, things. He's expected of murder, all these things. And this starts his downward trend. And they go after his person named Underhill, who's the guy who set the bomb. Okay. And they, you know, you know, they shake him down. They say, look, you're going to go to jail for life and all this stuff unless you turn state witness. He turned state witness, and um, so they let him out. Not Michael Thevis, but they let Underhill out. And so Underhill's still in Atlanta, and about five years later, 1978, Michael Thevis breaks out of jail, okay? And he comes back to Atlanta, and he kills Underhill, and then he gets caught because he's trying to withdraw money from some bank in Connecticut just like a couple months later. But this is really interesting. So when the when everything the scrutiny starts the screws start turning on him and the scrutiny comes, all of a sudden Jimmy Jen, who's running Hotlander Records, who's running um Jen Music, I think he's also running that general recording corporation for Thevis. This is what I'm thinking. Um, starts modern films. So on the incorporation uh, for modern films, it starts on 15 October 1973. Within a month after this maze guy is killed, and then that's when the government starts hammering down on uh, Michael Thevis, which I find that very, very interesting. And let's see... Is there anything else here? Oh, no, he's not arrested for about three years. I could be wrong on that. All right, let's see. Is there anything else there? Okay, and then we're going to go back over to Jimmy Jen's. I found some other interesting information. So basically, it's almost, you know, I hate to say I'm right all the time, but... I make a, a theory or speculation and then later on I run across evidence that basically proves most of what I was su supposing, okay? So it's sort of like a scientist. You know, a scientist has a theory, a theorem, okay? And then he does a series of tests to prove that theory. 
well, I'm not doing any tests. I'm just doing research and I'm randomly coming across these things or systematically actually. And it almost backs up almost everything that I was theorizing. So my theory is, is that Michael Thevis, once he gets busted or before he gets busted, he starts dispersing his assets because he doesn't want the government to come after him and get him and take everything. So he's he sends off some, you know, the film industry and the record industry over to uh, Jimmy Jen, okay, who would have been, what, let's see, Jimmy Jen was born in 1946, so in 1973, he would have been 27, okay, so he starts dis uh, dispersing, you know, his um, assets, amongst different people. Jimmy Jen, his secretary, his wife. Oh, his secretary is the one that would go visit him and then the police would watch them, you know, hanky-panky um, in the office, the commander's office at the jail. And then she's the one that helped him escape. And also she was the secretary, his girlfriend, was the one that was found in the car at the bank and they had, what, over $50,000 in the back trunk of the car, and she was charged uh, with some things also. But they let her out on bond, actually. But anyway, so yeah. So, and then some of the things went to his wife. They, the IRS and the FBI tried to play his wife against him, and that kind of worked for a while. I'm not exactly sure. They got some of his assets back that he had signed over to her. And uh, then his secretary... You know, you got his secretary buying up, you know, his seven, eight dollar an hour secretary buying up hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, his publishing company and recording company and transferring it over to her name, which I find very interesting. So, and then you've got Jimmy Jen, okay, who had to have been running this um, studio over there off of uh, 125 Simpson because I got a news article here. Let me see. Act One Music. Apogee Studios. Yeah. Wait, hold on. No, Sound Pit. Yeah. It was, so it was Sound Pit and then it became Apogee because um, Jimmy Jen went in there and changed the name at 125 Simpson. So, Jimmy Jen is involved with, um, you know, Thevis right from the very beginning. Now, whether, again, whether he knew about all the illegal stuff, I find it impossible for him not to have known about all the illegal things that Thevis was doing because he was there before Thevis got arrested in 76. He started these businesses that were financed basically by Thevis' organization. Okay, this... Um, and then there's also earlier that year um, I found a uh, conviction. There's an appeal for conviction that in, on 16 February 1973, um, I found an appeal for conviction for passing counterfeit money to purchase TV sets. And that was against Jimmy Jen. So that must have happened like in 1972. And again, you've got him living over there off of Hightower, right down the street from Wayne Williams. The house was built in 1958, still trying to find out when he lived there. Okay, um, he attended Morehouse College. Actually, his son attended Morehouse College, 1988 to 1992. And then, again, you've got his son living all over that area where all the kids were disappearing right across the highway from Stewart Lakewood Shopping Center over there at um, Lakewood Fairgrounds. It's really interesting. And then, I'm going to go over this later, but there was something happened here with, um, 
anyway, this Curtis Terrell did a GoFundMe because I guess he had had a stroke or something a couple of years ago. But remember, Jimmy Jen's father died in 2016. And then what you see is that all these incorporations, uh, business listings start happening after 2016 under Jimmy Jen Jr. All right. And uh, let's see, just scan through this. Yeah, there's Modern Films, but that was incorporated 15 October 1973. Again, it's right over there off Memorial. And let me see here. Also, Modern Films had a another location at 341 Pete Street. Okay, and let me show you that one. This is another address that they had. So they had this one off Memorial, and then this is back in the 70s, and then they moved it back in the uh, the late 70s, early 80s. They moved it up to this other location in Buckhead, and let me show you where that's at. So again, the dates are really really hard to place, but. I find it very, very interesting how close they were to everybody. So here, okay, right here off Peachtree Avenue, this is Peachtree. Over here is Piedmont. And guess what? If you go up this road here, okay, and then if you go, so what is this? West Far Road? No. Yeah. So if you go up here to Far Road, over this way, you're right at Shadow Lawn, okay? Right where Wayne Williams was taking these kids, again, nearby. So you had Wayne Williams taking the kids to this Gin Music-owned Hotlanta Records down in College Park to audition kids there. You had Wayne Williams taking kids to this 125 Simpson Road address, formerly owned by Thevis and now owned by Jin Music. And then I'm going to show you where Jimmy Jin actually tried to buy this at the auction after Wayne Williams was arrested. And then you've got another location for another business owned by Jimmy Jin, which is this modern movies, whatever... What's it called? Uh, Modern Films. And it's right around the corner from the Shadow Long location where Wayne Williams is bringing kids again. So you got one, two, three connections with Wayne Williams right there, plus the Hightower location where his dad lived, right down the road from when Wayne Williams lived. And then you got all those connections with the Lakewood addresses that his son's living at, but this is like. 30, 40 years later. Very, very bizarre. All right, and then, let's see. And then he owned a liquid antiques market. Um, and this Gen Music Group, okay, was listed at this rental address, 1440 Lakewood Avenue. Okay, just right down the road from where he had this liquid antiques address. And there's another one here. The prior address is right near the Lakewood address. Um, gosh, where's that news article? Hold on one second. Ah, uh, so I just found this one. So you see this one here. You've got Atlanta Sound Pit Productions, okay? That's the name of the studio, okay, that Jimmy Jen lost in the IRS um, bidding, and he lost the uh, lawsuit. 
and that was May June of 1981 and, and look at the address right there 881 Memorial Drive it's the same address as the movie production company okay so where's it at Modern Films 881 Memorial Drive so that's the connection right there between the sound pit which had been owned by Michael Thevis where Wayne Wayne's been hanging out Jimmy Jen and another partner tried to bid for it they got the high bid but the they couldn't come up with the money in time so the IRS sold it off to this Kimball guy okay and so they end up suing the IRS and they lost that so then they started they moved it sound you know they they started another business with the same name Atlanta Sound Pit Productions and they put it over at the same address 881 Memorial Drive crazy 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 all right hold on one second yeah, and you see right here, Ron Freeman, and there's Jimmy Jen, right there. All right, hold on one second. Let's try this one. Hold on, Apogee. All right, let me let me go through this real quick. Yep, there we go. So, again, what what do we learn from this? So, there's something going on with Jimmy Jen, Senior, and Michael Thevis. Like I said, it's the rump. It's a portion of the rump empire of Michael Thevis. So when he gets sent off to jail. He divides his empire between Jimmy Jen, his secretary, his girlfriend, his wife, and then he's running it from jail. Matter of fact, he gets sued by the IRS because they take him to court. I've read some um, lawsuits from the IRS in like as late as 81, 82. They're saying he's still running his empire from jail. And he's using this um these people jimmy jen and uh his wife and his girlfriend just for the paper the paperwork but it's really him running it and backed by you know the mafia money so i'll put it to you this way there's no way in hell that jimmy jen came up with millions of dollars to buy all these, the movie business, the sound pit, all the other leftover assets of Michael Thevis's empire, okay? He had all those record labels here, I'll show you, you know? And Gen Music owns the rights to all of these businesses, Act One Music. So he owns all the residual rights for that. Anytime someone sells something from Act One Music, Jimmy Jen's Jen Music is getting a, a cut of it. Apogee Studios, Aware Music, Bill Haney's Music Estate. Okay, I, I saw a record shop. I came across a record shop on Google in England and Australia that was selling Bill. Haney Records, okay? So every time they sell one, Gen Music's getting a little bit of money. He inherited this General Recording Corporation. All these different music labels. Hotliner Records, okay? So, you know, like, I, I had this boss in Texas. I worked for this bottled water company, run around tracking down all these water um, dispensers and 
he was really wealthy. My boss uh, was like in his early 30s, driving one of those red Ferraris like Magnum PI, and he had a lot of money, and he owned this water company, okay? And the biggest in all of Texas, I believe. And back in the warehouse, back in the back where they had the filtration machines was this older guy, and they were Greek, and so the guy would, had a really bad attitude, and he was always yelling and screaming and cursing and all this kind of stuff. But this Greek guy, when he lived in New York, he came from Greece, or his dad came from Greece, and he was a janitor. And so back in the 70s or so, he came up with this idea for a soap dispenser that you would just, you know, the ones you go up and you put your hand underneath it and you either pull the lever or it automatically senses your hand and dispenses the soap. He got the patent for that, okay? Being a janitor, he came up with a patent. And he got rich from that. And what that patent does is anytime anyone wants to build or manufacture those little soap dispensers, he's got the patent for 20, 30 years, they've got to pay him a residual, okay? And think about how many goddamn bathrooms there are in the United States and how many buildings there are around the world. Around the world, okay? He's getting a percentage of that. You know, if you got a soap dispenser that costs $10, he's maybe getting 50 cents, but my God, 50 cents out of a billion fucking soap dispensers you'd be pretty damn wealthy and so this guy who was a janitor got all of a sudden very very rich he took all his money he moved down to Texas and he had like four children five children and as they all went to college he paid for them to go to college they all got a degree in business or whatever I'm sure not basket weaving or fucking Eastern philosophy and as they came online, he handed them a business. Here, you're going to run the water company. You're going to run, I think it was an aviation fuel company that they had that would check aviation fuel to make sure it was good. And there was like all these other businesses that he would just take his money that he got from his residuals and buy up all these businesses. And then as his kids came online, he'd have them run it. Now, my grandparents did the same damn thing. I had a granddad that was you know owned a bunch of land on uh saint simon's island and cumber or no uh, jekyll island as it started to be developed in the 50s and 60s he got wealthy and he sold you know those little parcels of land or he leased them out and he got rich and so he took his money and he bought back in the 50s a concrete company a bridge company and a road company. And as his sons went to college and got online, he gave them each one of these businesses. These, that was my granddad, okay? And so they started building all these highways through Georgia down to, Hawaii, uh, down to Florida. And he would bid for contracts and they would get a bridge here or a bridge there or a road here or a road there. And of course, they had a lot of concrete in southeast Georgia. Dixie concrete, they were making all the concrete for all the fucking bridges and highways. Okay? So they got rich. And they had each one of them doing a certain business. And of course, he died. And then, of course, now all my great uncles and granddad have died. But, and then all their kids are all rich and fat and spoiled and all kinds of you know, a bunch of losers and stuff. Um, but that's what you do, okay? And this is what Thevis did. He took all of his assets, these restaurants, um, and a lot of these restaurants he didn't own exclusively. The Gambino families were, you know, silent partners in the background. And so he already had people running them you know, I'm sure Jimmy Jen was already working for him in the music industry. And he just handed it all over to him. Because Jimmy Jen, who got arrested 
six month, a year before for passing fake counterfeit bills, probably didn't have two fucking nickels to rub between his legs. So where did he get millions of dollars to buy all these record labels and recording studios? He got it from Michael Thevis and the Gambino family. Okay? <laughs> anyway, and again, even though it's the porn industry and Michael Thevis is killing people and blowing them up, doesn't mean that Jimmy Jen was involved in that or involved in the Atlanta child murders. But, you know, birds of a feather. That's all I can say. Birds of a feather stick together. You're not going to have little church ladies getting involved with pornographers, okay, and running their business. You're not going to have Boy Scouts who are one day selling cookies and then now they're taking over a music studio for former pornographer and mafia guy, okay? It doesn't work that way. Choir boys go work with other choir boys. You know, bad guys go work with other bad guys. And it works the same other way. You're not going to have Michael Thevis's cohorts who've been blowing up people and assassinating people and running peep shows and selling drugs out of clubs. They're not all of a sudden going to become choir boys and start running churches and, you know, civic organizations. It doesn't happen that way. So, maybe Jimmy Jen doesn't know anything. Maybe he's completely innocent, but I doubt it. You know, I've worked with other company people, found out they were crooks, and I quit because they were fucking crooks. Or maybe even criminals. Once I found out, if you stick around and you know something's wrong, then you're just as guilty as they are. So anyway... Jimmy Jen Sr. was involved with Michael Thevis in the very beginning. And when Michael Thevis got in trouble with the IRS and everybody else for murder, he handed over all the recording stuff, the studios, the record labels, to Jimmy Jen. Okay? And then all the restaurants and the cigar shops, all the porn shops got shut down. The IRS got rid of those. But all the other ones, the restaurants, the legitimate stuff, okay? I think you had a publishing company. That got all distributed between his wife and um, his uh, secretary and his girlfriend. But Jimmy Jen looks like he got the majority of the legitimate businesses. I didn't list it as a publishing company he also got. Okay? So, birds of a feather, my friend. And then again, you know, you got Jimmy Jen Jr., who's 12 years old when the Atlanta murders are happening. I, again, birds of a feather. Um, if you're raised by a criminal, you're most likely going to be a criminal. Not all of them. He could be a choir boy. I mean, how many times do we see how many of these people whose dad was a murderer, they became a minister? But, you know, <laughs> I very much doubt that. But I, I find it strange that Jimmy Jen's living exactly in the exact area where all the pornographers were living, right next, you know, the... Okay, here, let me, let me show you again. Um... Hold on one second. All right, so this is where Modern Films is located. And then this studio gets located here, the music studio. Right here is Cabbage Town. It's not a very big area. It's basically bordered by the building that Modern Films is located, this street right here, all the way over to Oakland uh, Cemetery, up to the the railroad tracks and then down to Memorial. That's Cabbage Town. And everybody, everybody knew 
that there was something going on with child pornography in Cabbage Town. Everybody knew about it. I remember it. And I was 13, 14 years old. And I remember hearing the stories about the Cabbage Town pornography that was going on. Okay, and here we have one of Michael Thevis' cohorts has a movie production studio that opened up right there right after Michael Thevis started his decline. So everybody knew about it, okay? And then right near here is where all these kids are disappearing. Almost every kid disappeared from here over into Cab County. Okay? Right here, one kid disappeared here, he was found here. Many of these kids live back in this neighborhood here. Another kid disappeared right here off a of second. Darren Glass completely gone. Another kid was right disappeared at the crystals right here. Many of them disappeared right there, okay? Right here is Moreland. And then down Moreland's where all the other kids disappeared in the Cab County. And this is Grant Park, okay? Over here, many, uh, one body was found here. I believe, um, Two of the kids are almost kidnapped here. And then you start working your way down to Lakewood. And then you've got the pornographer who was convicted in May was living here. And then right here, 40 years later, in this neighborhood, is where Jimmy Jen's senior son sets up all his businesses and is living. Right across from Stewart Lakewood, we all know about the Alamo... Um, motel the pornography motel there of course Lee Terrell disappeared from the swimming pool right there it's all the same fucking area again let me emphasize that just because this guy is in with Michael Thevis in the very beginning the pornographer and he takes over all of Michael Thevis's uh, recording studios and music labels, doesn't mean, and starts a, a movie production company right next to where everybody knew about the child pornography going on in Cabbage Town, doesn't mean he's involved in child pornography or pornography at all, right? It's all circumstantial. But my God, it's pretty fucking close, wouldn't you think? And just because, well, let's just take it on down the line, just because he's maybe involved in these music studios that Wayne Williams keeps plugging into and running through and taking these kids through, and he may be involved in the pornography industry and maybe even child pornography, doesn't mean that Jimmy Jen was involved in the murder and strangulation of all these children. It could be completely separate, parallel crimes, okay? Or actions. But, again, it's a small fucking world. Again, everybody knows everybody. Five degrees of separation, okay? <laughs> anyway. So we're going to move on back to my um, at kid master timeline. And where I left off was Angel Lanier. Okay. We're going to go over this for March 1980. So this is Wayne Williams got his car repossessed. So for three months or two months, January, February, he's got no car. Okay. Or at least that his dad is letting him use. So... Somehow he gets a car, and then he's out working it again with Angel Lanier. Now, how do we know that Angel Lanier, okay, was murdered by Wayne Williams? Well, there's not a lot of evidence, but we'll go over what we have, 
I'm sure I'm going to come across a lot more. Angel Lanier uh, lived at 1660 Stanton Road. Let's take a look at that. Okay, oh, she was 12 years old. All right, so here she is, right here, southwest Atlanta. Wayne Williams was living, what, right here? Just a quick jot right down the road. She's right on the other side of um, Fort McPherson, which is where I was stationed. But I wasn't stationed there until, what, 87? 87 to 88? Yeah, 87 to 88. And, again, just right down the road from this Lakewood area right here. Okay? Another thing is right here is where this committee to stop the murder of missing children started by Camille Bell is headquarters. It's just right down the road. Right down the road. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Oh, let's take a look at that house. Oh, I guess there's apartments there now. Okay. So it says here she was last seen at 7.30 p.m. on 4 March 1980 at a relative's house watching TV. She left her home wearing a denim outfit around 4 p.m. So I guess she must have done that before and then went to the house, her relatives. She was last seen at her friend's house watching Sanford and Son. Her body was found 10 March 1980. So how did she get out of the house without anyone seeing her? No one saw her go out of the house? That's interesting. All right. Then she was found at a wooden lot on Campbellton Road at the intersection of Willowbrook. Now I've got an approximation of a geocode here. Again, I'm taking the addresses and kind of doing my best guess at the geolocation. So, right here, and I picked this location because if you look over here, there's a house. I don't know if that house was there or not. And then across the street, you've got an apartment. I don't know if that was there at all. But it looks like there's a series of woods here. So if this is the intersection, that would be a good place to put her. See, there's a little creek bed here. There's some trees and then these, these bushes here. So that's a good place to put her. But again, it's kind of dangerous. It's not off a side street. Anybody could be driving by and see him tying her to the tree. So I find that interesting. It says two men were questioned, one of which wore a belt fashioned of an electrical cord and had been arrested for grabbing a child. This man lived at 1720 Beechwood. Now, I wonder what was the story on why the police were questioning them? What was, what was the police suspicion where someone a witness? Did they see something? Did they notify the police? How far is this from where the body was found? 1720 Beechwood, Atlanta. Can it find it? Nope, it's not able to find it, it's saying. Let's see. There's Avenue. Let's try Boulevard. All right. So he lived there, right around the corner. Okay. A relative of 
of his lived at 1596 Willowbrook. I don't know where they're getting this information, but I'm assuming this is from police reports. Yeah, right there. Um, it is suspected that she was held at in the homes of in the homes at 1954 Belcher. Well, how do they know this? What makes them say? This is all information from the AtKid website, so I don't know where they're getting this information. Again, that's right up near where Wayne Williams is living. All right, let's take a look at the other address. 1415 Westridge. Okay, this is right up the road there. So, Angel Lanier's body was found in a wooded lot on Campbellton Road at the intersection of Willowbrook Southwest, three blocks from her apartment. She was found in the clothes she left home in. Someone's white pennies were stuffed in her mouth and electrical cord bound her hands, ear, and, and, and I saw a video with her mother that said her ear, one of her ears and her lip were cut off or cut. So I'm not sure what the extent of that was about. And, you know, to me, what that would be is sending a message. They're putting the body up where it's going to be found. And then if you've cut the ear and you've cut the lip you're sending a message don't talk and you didn't hear anything that's what I would think but it could just be someone did that for whatever reason it says the cause of death was listed was asphyxiation by ligature strangulation so really the only thing that links her is the ligature strangulation and the geolocation okay She's in the same area where a lot of these other kids are going to end up disappearing. She's right down the road from Wayne Williams. So that's how I think they're linking her. Maybe there's other information I haven't come across that's linking her. All right. And let's see. Hold on a second. So we've got uh, Jeffrey Lamar Mathis. Now he's right up the street. And it's only, what, about a week later that he disappears. He's 10 years old. He lived at 471 East Ontario. Let's take a look at that. Again, he's right up near where Wayne Williams lives. Just a very easy drive right here straight down also just right down the road from where she was found what right right there yeah right here right here so not very far okay let's read some more about him at 7 p.m. Um, 11 March 1980 a silver fire plug near this is where he was last seen at East Ontario so let's take a look at that location oh wait a minute Got the wrong geolocation. Huh, interesting. Okay, hold on one second. All right, so here's the intersection. This is Overton, or Ontario, excuse me, and Ralph Abernathy. And there's the store where he was seen at. He taps at the window. There's the silver fire plug. 
and the blue car came by. A witness said she saw him standing at the silver fire plug. A blue car came by and he willingly got in the car. He wasn't forced in the car or anything. It says, getting into a blue car with a light-skinned man and a dark-skinned man, Jeffrey Mathis was last seen leaving the Star service station on Gordon to buy cigarettes or loaf of bread. Now, where is Gordon? Hold on one second. Well, I can't find Gordon. Uh, but again, he was seen right at the intersection here by that silver plug. Uh, so he was wearing a gray jogging pants, brown shoes, and a white and green shirt. Uh, the barber, W.A. Williams, on the corner of Gordon and East Ontario, saw Mathis knock on his window. So it's off of East Ontario. Hold on one sec. So this is weird. So if he lives here, but he was seen here off... Ontario and Gordon and he taps on the window but then a witness comes along later and says they see him over here at the fire plug that's kind of weird months later a girl said she saw him get into a blue car with a light skinned man and a dark skinned man on East Ontario next to the silver fire plug near Anderson's Produce. Witness Willie Turner, whose father lived in the McDaniel Glen, said he saw Mathis in a blue Nova. Okay. Um, nearly two weeks after he went missing across the corner from Stewart Lakewood Shopping Center again. Wow. Later he was held at gunpoint by the driver on 23 March. Now, how do they know this? Possibly on Campbell, Campbellton, behind an old building, uh, was found a briar-covered patch of woodlands near Super and Cascade. By FBI agents. Huh. Hold on one second. Again, so Cascade is just right here. If you follow Cascade over, it goes over. Hold on one second. Ah, so here it is. It's off of this 166 in Ken Creek Parkway. And you've got Plumer and Super and right there. This little dead end section here. Good place to dump a body. And that's where he was found. And let's see. Hold on, let me mark that. Hold on one second. All right, so it says, uh, found by FBI agents with trained dogs after Jeffrey's death. Um, then later, the drowning of Willie May's, May's nephew, Garrick. Who the heck is that? At the pool at Mosley Park, Homer Williams and James Jim Comento uh, came over to her home. So there's a connection there that Homer Williams... Wayne Williams' father knew Jeffrey Mathis' parents. And they were trying to find out about getting a police scanner. I don't know what that's all about. Um, on some other notes that's not at Kid Weebly, it says Jeffrey Mathis has been picked up by someone that was in a blue car. Witnesses said it didn't look like he had been forced to get in. Jeffrey's mother said that the body buried in his name is not her son. Jeffrey's sister also had been approached by a blue car. Police never bothered to canvass the neighborhood. In March 1980, two of Jeffrey's friends uh, reported to their teacher that the same car had tried to lure them to get in. 
they had a license plate info in the description of the car and said the car had been abandoned on a nearby street. The police claimed they couldn't find the car and then dropped the matter. A security guard at a nearby shopping center where Luby Getter, again back to uh, Stuart Lakewood, sold air fresheners to passerbys, claimed to have seen Jeffrey in a Blue Nova with a white man outside an adult bookstore on Stewart Avenue and that he also had seen the car outside the building that housed the recording studio for Wayne Williams rented from time to time. So there's a fourth studio. There's another one on Stewart Lakewood. Wow. I wonder what that one is. And so the authors took the info, because this is from the list. So this is actually on Lipstick Alley from notes from the list. It said the authors took the info and looked up the registered owner of the car who told them he had sold it in February 1980. That person said he had sold it to someone else. Uh, they found the car with new license plates registered to the people who lived in the house where it was parked. Neighbors said no boys or young men lived in the house, but the authors saw a pair of boys' gym socks hanging in the clothesline uh, when they visited also the night that Jeffrey Mathis disappeared, his brothers went looking for him at this house. Interesting. Okay. So here's a video. And this is interesting because this is Lou Graham, who eventually will become the sheriff of DeKalb County. And in 2005, I believe he tried to reopen the case of the DeKalb County murders, but then just as a just as quickly uh, dropped it also. I think it was a, a stunt because he was running for public office. But hold on one second. Bones were found around noon today. They were discovered off Subaru. Wait, hold on one second. Road. Went to catch a bus last July. Hasn't been seen since. Milton. 14. Left home to do an errand last September. Hasn't been seen since. Jeffrey Mathis, age 10, went to the store for his mother two weeks ago and hasn't been seen since. Hundreds of missing person calls come through here each week. But the thing that is concerning the police is the high number of young people missing. Kids too young to be thought runaways. And there's another concern. In several of the cases, the missing persons have been found, and their files were brought here to the homicide squad. And homicide detectives are now trying to see whether there may be a connection in the cases. There are some similarities in some of the deaths, only in respect that they're young black males or black females. And in a couple of incidents, uh, two of the young girls were on the way to the store and were missing for a period of two days to seven days that later turned up uh, found dead and stabbed. So police are still looking into the murder of nine-year-old Yusuf Bethul, checking into the mur murder of 14-year-old... So, so that's interesting, because he just mentioned two other females who were on their way to the store and were later found stabbed, but they weren't included on the list. That's pretty interesting. So Edward Smith, who was shot to death, and the murders of at least four other young people. 
All reported missing, all discovered killed. It's unfortunate that uh, right now that so many of these young people that have been found dead or unsolved, it's difficult for us to uh, determine the motives. And this is the problem that we've been having in two or three of the incidents. We need a motive to uh, initiate our investigation, really. This is what gets it off the ground. And we haven't come up with any motive. Of course, one has to wonder what's happening, just uh, what happened to the child, because once we find the child deceased and we never pick up a lead as far as to what actually happened to that particular child, we have to wonder what's happened to him, but we just don't know. Authorities told me they do not think at this point that one person is responsible for all the disappearances and hmm. deaths. And wow. all we can do now is just keep checking on leads. At the Atlanta Police Department, Hank Philippi, Action News. So, if you learn about the FBI profile, the profile says that the killer would be watching the news and following the news intently. Okay. Little did the FBI profiler knows would know that the killer was actually involved in covering the news. Wayne Williams was a stringer for news companies. So I find that interesting that Wayne Williams is watching this and he's getting a little chuckle. He's like he's like fucking with the police, like, ah, see they don't even know it. It's me. They think it could be a couple of other people, and they don't know what the hell's going on. And we'll just keep doing this because they have no idea what they're doing. So I find that interesting. Now, I remember this time specifically very, very intently because I was in eighth grade. It was springtime. We were getting antsy. We've been inside all winter in the cold, and I was getting ready for spring but all these crazy all this crazy shit started happening in March April May of 1980 so you had like Mount St. Helens blew up I was totally fascinated with that they had um, I remember used to go to Six Flags and they had this big dome type of uh, building you go in there and sit down and they had this film that they would show and it would go kind of up the dome, you know, so it was kind of covering above you and then in front of you and then on the side, too. So it was almost like 3D. And they had taken these cameras, so kind of a new way of filming, and put them in these boxes. I think they put like two or three cameras in the front and one camera on each side or something like that. And then one on the top and one on the bottom. And it kind of gave almost a 3D kind of uh, feel to it they put it in this box underneath the helicopter I believe or airplane and they flew it around Mount St. Helens after it blew up now this is maybe a year or so later they did this um, but it was amazing it, the film was totally incredible I just remember sitting there and you know we're looking up you can see the sky you're looking down you can see the ground you, you look to the right, look to the left, and look ahead of you. It was really amazing, this whole process. And that all happened in 1980. And then, of course, we saw this at the uh, Six Flags. Now, it says, on 15 April 1980, Camille Bell and parents of other missing and slain children suspected connection in the murders informed the committee to stop uh, the children's murders. Their address was at 2044 Camelton Road. Very appropriate because all around them was where all the kids started disappearing. Um, also at this time, on the same day actually, was the beginning of the Mario Cuban boat lifts. And some of these Cubans, they'd emptied the, Castro emptied some of his jails. They had a lot of criminals and mentally ill people. He emptied the mental hospitals and he just sent them on the boats to the United States. And this is what started that, the Cuban drug crime wave down in Miami um, also around the same time just a few days later uh, the US had launched a hostage rescue mission the helicopters they didn't have enough helicopters because the uh, mechanical failures and stuff like that so they had landed at this emergency airstrip they had made were refueling and we're gonna run back to the aircraft carrier 
and I guess the plane smashed into the fuel truck in the darkness, blew up, killed a bunch of uh, American military people, and that was the end of the hostage crisis. And that was kind of a disappointment. And then 18 May, Mount St. Helens blew up again, but really big. I mean, wait. Yeah. This was like the huge explosion because it, it had started steaming back in March and little minor tremors but the big one where it went sideways it went north that was incredible I've been there many times and it, even to this day it's like a Mars moon landscape there's just nothing there the, just everything was covered under ash and there was a, a geological guy can't remember his name Johnson I believe and he was sitting on this ridge about 20 miles north maybe five miles north of the mountain and he had these cameras set up and the last they heard of him he got on the radio and says Vancouver Vancouver because that's where the uh, geological survey office was Vancouver this is it this is it and then boom he got wiped out and so they call it Johnson Ridge because he was buried under this ridge of ash where the mountain went from 10,000 feet and then just started sliding northward for the next 10 miles and just wiped out everything. Because when the volcano went off, all the snow on the mountain all melted at once and it liquefied all the ash and all the, the soil and it was like a tidal wave you know but it was a tidal wave that was like 300 degrees Fahrenheit and it just wiped out everything but that was pretty incredible um, let's see and then on the same day that Mount St. Helens erupts because see I'm in high school or junior high and every day you come home there's something happening in the news here <clears throat> you got national news international news and then you got the local crazy news about the Atlanta murdered uh, children going on. All right, so we're going to stop here and we'll get into um, what happened with uh, Eric Middlebrooks on the next video when I come back around um, to reading the At Kid timeline. So let me mark where I'm at here so I don't forget. And... Uh, We'll get into something different next time. Let's see. I don't know yet, but we'll figure it out. I think... Um, hold on one second. Yeah, I'm going to finish up on that uh, Supreme Court case. There's some more information on that. I want to read and get on to the uh, record here. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye.